What if the signs we see today are leading us closer to Christ's return than we ever imagined? And my guest today, Steve Miller is here and he's he wrote a book called Four Shadows, 12 Mega Clues That Jesus' Return is Nearer Than Ever. Um, Steve, thank you for joining me today. It's great to be with you, Nancy, and with your uh, the call audience. Thank you so much. I, I'm just going to jump in and ask, how do you handle doubts about biblical prophecies? Doubts about biblical prophecy can be intimidating for people. But what's helpful is if we look at what Bible prophecies have been fulfilled through the ages, especially those prophecies concerning Christ's first coming, and there were over a hundred of them, we see that God's track record for Bible prophecy is 100% fulfillment. And so if God fulfilled all the prophecies of the past up till now with a 100% track record, we can have full confidence that everything from here on out will also be fulfilled in a literal way. And that is a testimony to God's faithfulness. It's a testimony to the fact that he keeps his promises. It's a testimony to the truthfulness and the reliability of scripture. And in fact, there are people who do become Christian and they see the evidence of Bible prophecy, that it has proven itself, that it has proven God's authority over all things. Mm -hmm. And so that can give us a lot of comfort and that can be very helpful for us. When you're talking, I'm thinking about people that are very wrapped up into biblical prophecy right now, and maybe listening to things that are not correct. Um, do you see like a lot of the prophecies being fulfilled now? We can say that there's a lot going on right now that falls in the realm of fulfillment. But I'll go ahead and back up a little bit to what you were saying about those who can be overly involved in Bible prophecy or those who might fall for views that are inaccurate. It is possible for someone to be enthusiastic about Bible prophecy with the wrong motives. Uh, our motives shouldn't be trying to figure out what's going to happen here, what's going to happen there, who's going to do this, who's going to do that, to try to get a jump on what's supposed to happen. A lot of times we approach prophecy almost as fortune tellers. We want to predict the future. Scripture does predict the future for us, but there's so much more to prophecy than just knowing about the future. Prophecy is meant to let us know that God is sovereign. He's in control. He has a plan for the world. We're part of that. We as Christians are part of that plan. Uh, prophecy communicates to us the urgency of being salt and light in a time where we're getting near to the end of the age, to uh, Christ's second coming. So there are a lot of things that are very relevant for us about prophecy, but we need to be careful how we handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, about the prophecies that are happening today that uh, we're seeing fulfillment with, I would say the number one fulfillment that is just absolutely amazing and still amazing, even though it took place in 1948, was the rebirth of Israel, when Israel became a nation again. You've got a nation that's been scattered for 2,000 years, and now it's back in its own land. Uh, God sovereignly made that happen. No other nation has ever had that happen before. Mm -hmm. So you've got the nation of Israel in the land, and that makes it possible for the prophecies of the second coming to be fulfilled. All the prophecies about the end times cannot be fulfilled unless they're the literal nation of Israel in the land. And I would say number two is we see what's happening with the prophecies in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel chapter 38, which talks about a future invasion of Israel by a, a group of nations. Well, that group of nations if we look at their ancient place names and compare them to their modern place names, we see that they involve Russia, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, and some other Muslim country. For thousands of years, these countries had no relationships with one another. But in the last few decades, they've all been forming alliances. They've been all been forming trade relations. They've all been working together militarily. We're seeing them come together. And just this last weekend, President Erdogan of Turkey said the only way we're going to be able to stop what Israel is doing in Gaza is to have an alliance of Muslim nations. And what does Ezekiel 38 talk about? An alliance. These are evidences that God is prophetically active in our midst. Um, I really understand what you're trying to do. You're, you're trying to show not like all these different interpretations, but what what is actually happening. So, you know, there are so many different views um, and different interpretations of end time prophecy, what is what is really the correct one, so that people kind of know, you know, what they should be expecting. 
it's unfortunate that we do allow ourselves to be divided by different views of when things will happen. And while it's okay for us to be persuaded one way or another, while it's okay for us to be diligent of uh, students of Scripture and try to figure out, okay, what is God saying? What is that timeline? What is the chronology that Scripture is giving us? I think it's important that we focus on the things that we do agree will happen. We do agree that God is going to judge the world. We do agree that Christ is going to return. We do agree Christ will rule the earth uh, during the millennial kingdom, after he returns, after he judges his enemy. There are a number of points on which we agree about the end times. But what's important is to realize that God is active in our midst. Things are moving forward to what Scripture says is going to be fulfilled. Scripture makes it very clear things are happening. As we look around us, we can't help but feel this sense that things are happening. And this explains how even non-Christians are very curious about what's going on in the end time. But if the very fact that Israel is a nation again, that's the stage. God has put the stage out, and now he's putting all the pieces in place. He's setting that stage, and that should put us in a state of high alert. Now I'm going to ask you about these 12 key signs, the, the mega signs, the mega clues you you see pointing to Christ's return. There are more that I could have chosen, but these are ones that I felt are so obvious they're hard to ignore. Scripture describes for us, uh, especially in Matthew chapter 24, when Christ explained to the disciples, these are the signs you will see when the end of the age comes. And Christ spent a whole chapter, all of Matthew 24, explaining the signs of the end of the age and there are other signs that are revealed to us in other places in Scripture. Many of these signs line up with what I share in the book. And as we look at what Scripture says about the future, what will happen in the future, we see that these events are casting shadows into our day. Hmm. We know that seven, the seven-year tribulation is not a long enough period of time for all of what's supposed to happen in the end times unfold, which means we have to be ramping up toward that. We have to be moving toward that. We know, for example, in Revelation 13, that there will be a one-world government. The Antichrist will rule the world. Well, what are we seeing take place now that is ramping us up toward that? Uh, we know that there will be a one-world economy. Uh, the Antichrist will uh, make will uh, make uh, orders about uh, uh, whether people can buy or sell. The Antichrist will control who is able to buy or sell. So that tells us there will be a one-world economy. There are all these clues about uh, the European Union today, we see it fractured. We see that clue evident in the statue in Daniel chapter 2, the statue where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he saw the head of gold that was the, the Empire of Babylon, the chest and arms of silver that was Medo-Persia, the thighs that were Greece, the legs that were Rome, and then the feet, which are iron and clay. The fact that the feet are iron and clay, the iron tells us that there's remnants of Rome in there, remnants of ancient Rome, but the clay is trying to piece all that together. We see a fractured European Union today that is trying to unify its people. And we see that in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, you've got the descent into moral and spiritual corruption. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 24 mm -hmm. that at the time of my return, it will be like the days of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, tells us that the days of Noah, every thought on man's heart was continually evil. And we live in a day where we see evil is rampant today. We see the assault on truth. Christ's very first uh, sign that he mentioned in Matthew 24, he talked about deception. Deception is anything that goes against the truth. He talks about persecution. He talks about how when the Antichrist enters the temple at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Jews are to flee, which tells us that anti-Semitism will reach its peak during the tribulation. Mm -hmm. All of these things are things that we see ramping up in our time now. We see signs of one world government. We see signs moving us toward a one world economy. We see signs of truth being assaulted. We see signs of anti-Semitism on the increase. We see signs of Christianity uh, being persecuted. All of this is evidence that I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. Well, you're really making it so clear, more clear than I realize that it is, um, because I've already studied the book of Revelation once before, but... You're really bringing it together in a way that in modern day we can understand. So, you know, with Israel at war, what do you think will happen next? It's hard to predict what will happen. 
We just don't know. What we can rely on is what scripture tells us. There are some people who think that what's happening now with Israel and Gaza is in scripture. And I would say, along with some other prophecy teachers, that that's probably not so much the case in terms of specific prophecy. Now, Psalm 83 does prophetically talk about how Israel will be persecuted through the ages. It does talk about how Israel's enemies will come against Israel through the ages. And the reason I say through the ages is as you look at the enemies of Israel described in Psalm 83, these are enemies that exist at different times through history. So Psalm 83 is taking the big picture view of Israel constantly being the scourge of the nations that are around it. We see what's happening in Gaza today. Some people wonder, well, is this Ezekiel 38 happening? Well, we can't say that because Ezekiel 38 gives us the specific nations that will be involved in that invasion. And right now it's pretty much limited to Iran working through its terrorist proxies, Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and the Iranian terrorists that are supported in uh, Iraq and Syria. So we have these proxies, this ring of fire, so to speak, around Israel that's coming against Israel. But we haven't seen a, an all-out Russia, Iran, Turkey alliance that's supposed to come against Israel as prophesied in Ezekiel 38. And we also know from Zechariah 12 through 14 and in the book of Revelation that the Antichrist will call all the nations against Israel. Well, that hasn't happened yet. So we haven't seen the alliance in Ezekiel 38 invade Israel yet. We haven't seen the Antichrist order the world to come against Israel yet. Mm -hmm. But what we are seeing is a world that is upset with Israel, that wants to see the war in the Middle East end, and that is telling Israel, you must accept a two-state solution. And the two-state solution requires Israel to coexist peacefully with these terrorist nations. Mm. which will leave Israel vulnerable to the future. Uh, Times do not look good for Israel, unfortunately, but that is all to be expected, prophetically speaking. But we know that Israel is still God's chosen nation. And in Ezekiel 38, God makes it very clear that when that invasion happens, he himself will intervene in the battle and he will bring victory to Israel. So God will stand by Israel. And we know that Israel will continue to exist because we see Israel mentioned in the Millennial Kingdom in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel. So Israel will survive. That's so true. That, that Very clearly put. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. So, you know, you've said Israel's darkest time is still ahead. What do you think that will look like? It is still ahead of us because of what Ezekiel 38 describes and because of what uh, Revelation describes and Zechariah describes about the end times. What we're seeing today, tragically, is that Palestinian terrorist leaders have carefully crafted narratives about Israel that are not true. Narratives that say Israel is oppressing us. Narratives that say Israel is a colonizer. Narratives that say Israel is starving the people in Gaza. To say that Israel is a colonizer doesn't make sense because Israel occupies only one little strip of land that was legally and internationally given to them uh, by a different decree, starting with the uh, British mandate in 1917, all the way up through what the United Nations granted in the partition of the land in 1947. Uh, so that land was legally given to the people of Israel. So it doesn't make sense to say that they're colonizers. If anything, it's the Muslims who are the colonizers because they began in uh, the area where Muhammad began Islam and spread all through the 22 nations that are now Muslim nations all around Israel and all into North Africa. Uh, this whole bit about Israel starving people in Gaza, a couple months ago, the United Nations had to retract that claim because they found out that actually what's happening is Hamas is taking all the food that gets moved into Gaza, and then they are reselling it to the people of Gaza at very high cost in order oh. to profit from it. And so what we're seeing is these narratives are creating a situation which gives the international community a wrong perception of Israel. And in these ways, unfortunately, tragically, the international community is turning against Israel. And even the United States, who's been a strong ally of Israel through the year, is coming more and more against Israel. The United States, when it agreed to put up that pier in Gaza to bring humanitarian aid in it, the United States actually struck an agreement that the company that would help build that pier was owned by Hamas, of all things. So things do not look good for the future. We're seeing a situation where the United States is slowly pulling out 
from its commitments in the Middle East and it's creating a vacuum countries like China and Russia and Iran are going to step into. So yes, dark mm -hmm. days are ahead. And and so Israel is facing a new period of increased danger, is what you're telling me. Very much so. What we're seeing happen too is the negotiations for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Every time we seem to get close to a, an agreement, Hamas ups their demands for what they want. In other words, they're not conceding ground. Everyone is asking Israel to concede ground. They're moving the goalposts. Iran did the same thing with the nuclear deal, the nuclear deal that uh, the U.S. struck with Iran, which Trump pulled out of a few years ago. And the current administration is trying to get us back into that deal. Well, negotiations, negotiations have been going on for three years now. Why? Because Iran keeps upping the ante, keeps moving the goalposts, keeps saying, this is what we want, this is what we want, this is what we want. And unfortunately, the world falls for that. The world is so tired of war, they say, Israel, just give them what they want. And that puts Israel in a bad and dangerous place. And they're sticking to their guns, Israel. They're they're just, you know, they're trying to get their the, the captives back. And, and that's their goal. And they're still working on that. How does your book help Christians balance the urgency of prophecy with everyday life? By talking about how prophecy is relevant to us. So often we look at prophecy as just these are issues about the future. But when God reveals prophecy to us, he does it for some very specific purposes. He does it to show that he is sovereign. He's in control. Mm. And if God is sovereign over all these big things that are happening in the world, then he's also sovereign all over all the little things that are happening in my own life, which gives me a lot of comfort. As we look at prophecy, we notice that all of these warnings about what will happen in the future conclude with an arrival of justice and righteousness in the world. So God wants us to know that justice is coming, righteousness is coming, evil will not prosper always. We look at the book of Psalms where David got frustrated because evil prospered. And we get frustrated, we see evil prosper. And we see Christians being silenced and marginalized in today's society. Well, scripture, the prophetic passages of scripture show us we have no need to be worried, we have no reason to be anxious. Um, we realize the suffering suffering and tribulation, those are temporary. And I think above all, the biggest place where prophecy is relevant today to us is as we look at Bible prophecies, we look at all the promises of Christ's first coming that God would send a Savior to bring us back to him. He was showing his love and his mercy and his grace. And he continues to show his love and mercy and grace through prophecy by saying that there is coming the greatest revival ever during the tribulation when many will be saved. But we also see God's justice and righteousness and fairness and trustworthiness evident in Bible prophecy too. So we get a better understanding of God's character as we look at Bible prophecy. And we realize that God, our God, loves us. He will care for us. He will protect us. He is sovereign. He's in control. We can rest. We can have peace knowing that the outcome is in his hands. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve, I thank you for making all this so clear to my audience because a lot of them are thinking, you know, what is going on right now? They're, they're a little worried. And, you know, and but not to worry. That's what you're saying. We have hope in Christ and he is the one who is going to, he's lighting the way for us. All we have to do is just follow him. So everyone, you can get Steve's book, Four Shadows, 12 Mega Clues that Jesus' return is nearer than ever at harvestprophecyhq.com. And you can also see his blog post there on biblical prophecy. He's really just writing all about this. And if you have questions, I'm sure you can ask him that. I'm sure that you can get this book also on amazon.com. And um, Steve, um, what would you like to leave my audience with today? Keep looking at the finish line. Don't get discouraged by what we see happening around us now. We are living in an age that is getting ever darker, and Scripture promised that. But there's a bright light at the end of it all. Uh, there's a millennial kingdom coming. There's eternity in heaven coming. Um, Daniel chapter 2 talks about how the stone that is cut without hand will strike the earth, and all of the human kingdoms of history will be utterly shaken to dust, and Christ's kingdom will fill the world. We who are Christians have the promise of being in that kingdom. We have a very definite purpose here now. Our purpose is to point people to Christ so that more people can be in his kingdom. Christ is using us to build his kingdom.
What if the urgency of these times is a call for us to live with greater hope and purpose, knowing Christ's return could be near? If you enjoyed this, please put the hashtag Jesus is coming in the comments below and like and subscribe for more Christ-centered interviews. Be sure to visit the website, thecallwithnancycebedo.com and see all the updates on our previous guests. Until next time, all glory and honor to King Jesus.